Hey guys, I'm Perry Nemiroff, and welcome back to Collider Best of the Week, the place to go if you don't have enough time to watch everything we post on the Collider Videos YouTube channel and all the written features that go up on Collider.com, and you want the best of the best all in one nice, neat little place. So let's jump right into it and move on over to Movie Talk. This week, we had some set photos from Wolverine 3 drop, and the panel discussed what they thought about them, and particularly what they thought about Hugh Jackman's wonderful beard. Mark Byrus saw the first images from the set of Wolverine 3. Oh, it's a huge buy for me. I love the way that an older Wolverine looks, an older Professor X looks, him helping him out. My first thought when I read this story was Eric LaSalle's in this movie? Sweet. All right. Good news. Going back to the pictures, yeah, they look great. It's what I would want to see an older Wolverine, an older Hugh Jackman look like the aging process that they put on him. If this is any indication as to how it's going to look on screen, it looks very natural. It does not look fake. Sometimes when you try to age actors too much, it just comes off as creepy and cheesy like they're wearing a Halloween mask. That's not going to be the case with Wolverine 3. I'm very excited by these images, and I buy them. How about you? Yeah, I'll buy them, too. Uh, I, You know, it's funny because Hugh Jackman is close to 50. He's pushing 50. Yeah, yeah so I, I, it's maybe it's less that they're aging him up and more like they're just not aging him down for this. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually what 50-year-olds look like, kids. <laughs> Believe it or not, <laughs> even gorgeous ones like Hugh Jackman. Um, I buy them. I buy seeing uh, Hugh Jackman and um, and Patrick Stewart together in, in the same in the same place again. I'm very curious about this story. And also, whereas I did not like The Rock's facial hair in his uh, solo uh, fast movie, Hobbs movie, I am digging Hugh Jackman's facial hair. That is a beard. That is a man. That, that is, is a man beard. A full beard. He looks like the before <laughs> in a Just for Men like commercial. But it's 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 what I want to see from Old Man Logan. I think that this movie is going to do kind of what Days of Future Past is, capture mm -hmm. the spirit of the comic book storyline, but it's not going to copy it uh, like page by page, frame by frame, especially given looking at these pictures, he doesn't have quite the same look as Old Man Logan does in the comic book. And not only right. that, the clothing and and the the location that I can see from these pictures make it look less of a post apocalyptic type of story and more of maybe maybe it's a dystopian type of movie, which is a lot different because it the environment wouldn't be like this where they've got cars and they're wearing like regular clothing. The, the the comic book was more like a, a futurist, uh, futuristic Western. So uh, that that's in, what's interesting to me. I wish they had shown pictures of just the entire set as well. Over on Heroes, these Wolverine 3 set photos were a hot topic as well, but instead of beard admiration, the group was talking about the young actress that was in the pictures and whether or not she could be X-23. Let's see what they thought. Well, I think it's probably a, a great possibility that that's the direction that they're going. I mean, I think we've seen uh, a lot of really strong female characters this year, especially we were just talking about Ray being one of them. And I think that's a great trend. I mean, I love seeing Scarlet Witch and Black Widow in uh, Civil War. Mm -hmm. Why not? Why not bring in X-23? And why not give Wolverine a relationship with it? maybe a daughter, maybe somebody he's just taking care of? I think it's a great way to go with the character. And especially if it's Hugh Jackman's last Wolverine outing. Right. Why not? We make assumptions based on our limited knowledge, not taking into account that there's probably a whole ton of crap that we don't know. We see a little girl in a poster. What's in our limited knowledge? X-23 is in her? our limited knowledge. Yeah. That must be what this is going to be. It's the clone. I mean, yeah. you know, the, there's a rumor a black guy might get cast in Spider-Man movie. He must be Morales. Oh, right. right, because we always operate within the little that we know, not taking into account the 98% of everything else that we don't know. So while it totally could be, mm. totally could be, I got to tell you right now, I'm putting on my money that it's something else. Well, it's going to be something else. Wolverine does have a tendency to drag little girls along on his adventures yes, with him. So there's a plethora of characters that it could right. be. <laughs> that's true. But you know what? In defense of the, the guessing game, that's <laughs> part of the fun. We have like a, we have a, a year to be like, could it be her? Oops, it's we were wrong. Fun. We make a career out I know, of it. I know. We fully enjoy talking about these strange possibilities. Possibilities, <laughs> but yeah, could that little girl be X twenty three? I don't know. It could be. John Williams was just awarded AFI's Lifetime Achievement Award, so the crew over at Jedi Council opted to use that as an opportunity to talk about the iconic composer's best work. John Williams <laughs> getting a Lifetime Award. It's, it's yeah, duh. I mean, yeah. of course, Lifetime guy, Achievement Awards were created for, for John Williams. It's a, yeah. He really is. He it's a his body of work. It's just some of the best music 
just in general, not even just for movies. It's like it is stuff that you can just listen to. It'll help you think. You know, it's a good. It's a good like for drives. But what it does for movies, like it just adds his pieces are characters in movies. They really are. It adds to everything. Without you take John Williams' music out of the major all of the movies that he's done, it's just not the same. What composer in history really can you go in ten bars or less? I can hum in ten bars or yeah. less, and you will. Pick mm -hmm. out ten of them. So, if, like, if, okay. So I just go to you. Da 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 da. It's close Encounters. There you go. Yeah. Dun 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 dun. Indiana Jones. Jaws. Uh, dun 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 dun. Shot man. Super. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Damn. So, like, it's like you can go. You can go on right. and on. We've talked about this with even the Marvel films, where it's like there is no real like you don't think of a song and tie it to a character the nope. way that John Williams does. And he said something funny where it was like he doesn't want. He was like, I'm gonna do another Star Wars, which yay, that was another thing that really stood out because he said he doesn't want anybody else to write for Daisy Ridley. Which I was like, that was so sweet. And one of those things where it is, you know, you do get really attached to the sounds and the songs that he creates for certain characters. Right. And that's what I think he's so brilliant at. Jaws is still just, I think it's just the greatest piece of music in movie history. And I love the Star Wars music. I love how when, as soon as you see the Star Wars opening crawl, it's just so loud and bombastic and in your face. And you know you're on this great adventure, but Jaws is so simple and it's so mm -hmm. scary. You could hear that score and not see anything on screen. And you know that there's an ominous presence looming and the way that score builds, it's just, it's very simple, but it gets the point across magnificently. So I love everything John Williams has done, but I think I'd go back, just that simple violin and Jaws. Let's roll into the Collider Nightmare section of the show. This week, we got a really great Twitter question from a viewer asking what a good first horror movie would be. Let's check it out. There's, there's a lot of different ways to have fun with the genre that aren't going to be traumatizing right. necessarily because I totally understand people who don't enjoy the genre. But um, some of the, speaking of slasher movies, I would argue that some of the older slasher movies, right? So yeah. maybe Halloween or, or the going. original Friday the 13th sure. might be a good option. Yeah, I would even say some of the, the, the later sequels when they get kind of ridiculous and sure. kind of funny, you could kind of do that. Like maybe... Nightmare on Elm Street Dream Warriors. That's when, you know, Freddy starts to practice out his jokes on, you know, for stand up. And, right. But it's still a little bit scary. You still have the mythology. Uh, it, it ropes back to the first one. So that might be one. I always go slasher because it's my favorite. Um, I even think of Friday 13th Part 6, Jason Lives. It's ridiculous. It's Jason as Frankenstein. He's brought back to life. And then he's super powered and he gets he, he's in a paintball war. And it's like it's ridiculous but gory with some scary moments. So those are my picks. Yeah, how about you guys? Anything spring to mind? First movie that comes to my mind is definitely Poltergeist. Great. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, it's a classic, so you check a box off that way. And it's also, I mean, it's scary. I saw it when I was little and I did have nightmares for it's a little totally while. It's totally frightening. It's frightening, but it's not that frightening yeah. in the sense that it's I tense. think it would make someone like tense, yeah. sick to their stomach or like up for nights on end. But at the same time, I also looked at, so, if you go to a kid, I'm dating myself, kids nowadays, but really kids nowadays, if you show them certain classics, odds are they're going to be like, Psh, you know, like I'm watching all this R-rated stuff. This yeah. isn't anything. I think if it's someone younger, a good one could be Trick or Treat. Oh, so Ooh. good. It's so got good. a classic feel, yet it's modern. It's Halloween, and anyone can tap into those Halloween traditions that that movie works with so well. So I'd say Poltergeist or Trick or Treat. Two great options there. I would, I would go back from Trick or Treat to Creep Show. Yeah. Because nice. I mean, that still yeah. lives up to, uh, even, the, you know, it's not 100% dated. You could still watch it. Some, some of the shorts are a little more dated than others. Sure. But it's a cool anthology. We've got two big wide releases making their way into theaters this weekend. And you know what that means. Junkin interviews. First up, let's hit Steve's interview with Ellen DeGeneres and Ed O'Neill for Finding Dory, during which he points out that it's actually one big modern family reunion. It seems like you had to be in Modern Family to be a part of this movie. Were you a little nervous that they were going to replace you when you heard so many Modern Family people were yeah. in this film? Sofia Vergara could oh. not do Dory because no one would understand her. <laughs> that's right. So that's the only reason I kept my job, because Sofia Vergara, <laughs> she tried out for Dory, and they're like, what? What are you oh saying? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, uh, no, I'm so thrilled. I mean, what? Uh, there's no funnier show on television than these group of guys. I'm 
it's, what a great idea. You know, Ty and I didn't even know we were both in it until after some time had gone by. Because, you know, when you go to work on another show, and, you know, you don't usually talk about what you're going to do outside of the show for a couple of reasons. So we didn't know it. And then suddenly, you know, someone, one of us heard we were both in it. So it was kind of nice. Now we've got something for Central Intelligence from Haley Fouch. She had the opportunity to sit down with Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart to talk about their new spy movie. So she asked them which big movie spy would win in a fight. Check it out. Ethan Hunt, James Bond, and Jason Bourne get into a spy versus spy. Which one walks out alive? Wow. And why? I think it's between Bond and Bourne. Yeah. I would say that. It's between Bond, Bond and Bourne. Bond and Bourne for sure, but and then Bourne, I would have to. Bourne is more, he's tougher. I gotta go with Bourne, dude. Bourne, Bourne is, Bourne's a machine, man. Yeah. yeah Bourne's a machine, I'm definitely, Bad I'm gonna dude. go with Bourne. Yeah. That would be my Bourne. pick, too. I'm gonna yeah. go with Bourne. Bourne, plus it's Matt Damon, he's gonna fuck it. That's the thing, which Bourne? Yeah, Matt yeah, Damon? yeah, yeah, well, which Bourne are we talking about? Because Matt Damon, Took Born to a different level. That's a, not oh, that's that, a bad not that the next Matt, not that the next Born was bad, but Matt oh, Damon no, Matt was Damon. he was he was hundred percent. He was like, the man. Yeah. That's the man. Moving on over to TV Talk, we have a great discussion over there about the pilots that Amazon recently decided to pick up. That whole pilot process on Amazon is really interesting, and David Griffin breaks it down, and the group talks about all of the shows that Amazon opted to pick up. Should be obvious which one I would go for. It's definitely going to be Carnival Row. Yeah. Uh, not 18th just because 18th century London. 18th century. <laughs> 1870, 18th century London, yep. in the set in the future. That I'm sold right there. Plus Guillermo del Toro's behind it. I love Amazon pilot season. They just drop like you know four or five new shows you can just sample from. There was one that came out a while ago called uh, Casanova with Diego Luna. Uh, I only saw the first episode. I don't know if it ever got picked up, but it was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and they they put them out there. You, you can vote on them. Uh, put how many stars. You can comment. They take that information. They decide which ones are going to make a series out of. So for me, once Amazon drops it's like this Tinder pilot, for TV. it is. Yeah. Once I see this, I'm definitely gonna check out the Guillermo del Toro one right away. Yeah. I just love the premise, uh, or at least what, I guess, I've never heard of the book or anything, but it looks fantastic. Yeah. Man, I mean, that mm -hmm. sounds awesome. Everything about it, the pedigree, really? the concept, I think it sounds so cool. If I were to pick a secondary one, I think the one about one of the first female stand-up comedians could mm -hmm. be really, really interesting, especially in that 1950s world, because you're dealing with so many gender politics, and then you're gonna start getting into like, you know, like Korean War stuff, and then Vietnam War stuff. The thing that I think sounds the least interesting is like the random superheroes, and I don't know the showrunner, and I don't know anything involved in it, and I'm just like, oh. But that's if it's a half hour, it, it, it could be a Com it, like a comedy about could, superheroes yeah. is always funny to me. But it just kind of worries me because everybody's doing superheroes. Feels like yeah. Amazon might yeah. just be like, "Hey, let me get a superhero show. Let's mm -hmm. get one out there." Totally. Wait, what about you? Definitely the the uh, stand up, the first female stand up. Oh, cool. To put it in the '60s, they'll do something like better than they did with Agent Carter, which I thought was just way too much. Like, oh, she's a dame. She can't be a spy, <laughs> right? So, like, I don't know. I would have like nine different accents on that. But <laughs> the, doing female stand up, it's going to hit on those things. Like, I love Lucy and like the struggle she had to get to one, the funniest show of all time, right? You had there's the struggle not only of being a female in the world, but being a female in a business where people don't instinctively want to laugh at you. I think that that's, it's a brilliant premise and I, and I really hope the show does well. Now it's time for the Collider.com portion of the show when we get to highlight some of the written features done by the team over there. We're gonna start with some Game of Thrones stuff. So per usual, if you are not caught up on the show, be warned, there are spoilers. Piece number one comes from Katie Burt. She writes about the Starks finally regaining some power and what they could possibly achieve in the final two episodes of the season. In addition, there's also a Game of Thrones article from Allison Keane about the Brotherhood Without Banners. She recounts what they do in the books, what they've been up to on the show, and also where they could be heading in season six now that they're back in play. Now moving on over to something Pixar themed for the release of Finding Dory. Adam Chitwood ranked all of the Pixar movies from worst to best. It's Wally all the way for me, but go over to Collider.com to see how the film stacked up for Adam. Now on to another ranked post. Every Netflix original series ranked from worst to best. This one's a staff post, so the whole gang came together to make this list, which includes everything from Daredevil to Orange is the New Black to Lady Dynamite. I love this one from Adam Chitwood. He listed the 20 most exciting cinematographers working today, as one might expect. Icons like Roger Deakins made the cut, but then there's also a bunch of others you might not be aware of that you need to read up on. Last up for .com, another big list. The best movies of 2016 so far. I didn't participate in this one, so Green Room is not number one, but there are a bunch of great picks like Civil War, Sing Street, and Zootopia, just to name a few. 
On this week's Schmodown, we have Gray Drake going up against Schmodown newcomer Jason Einman. Inman? I don't know. Let's check out a preview of how the match went down. I do question the life choices of anybody that dyes their hair extreme colors. I mean, maybe it's going to seep into the brain. Maybe at the last minute she's going to have some problems. Uh, Jason Inman, you don't know me in the traditional or the biblical sense, but let me tell you who I am. I'm a trivia monster. Jason, Justice Inman has what it takes to become the champion of the Schmodown because nobody is gonna be able to predict what I'm gonna know and what I'm not gonna know because I am a random sponge of movie knowledge. Look at my jungle spirit. Just look at it and feel it. <laughs> you woke up this morning and you felt it in your heart. Making his debut, ladies and gentlemen, Jason Justice. Buccaneers classic K. Oh, oh no, it's Superman, red. I like it's that. It's actually a red Look. Superman K. Ladies and gentlemen, Ray lights out Ray. Oh, oh very jungle kitty. Wow. Okay. Look, Look at, at this. this. Is that a panther? Oh, Is that she a just shot Inman and she Inman deflected. She has murdered Super. Okay, Superman bullets are fine. Yeah. Gray, we move on to drama. Drama. Which country is the setting for the 2003 hit Lost in Translation? Uh, what country? What country? J Japan. Another question mark and another yes. Okay. Wow. <laughs> right. In the category of drama, which actors played David Frost and Richard Nixon in Frost Nixon? Frank Langella and Michael... Mm. He's got it all. Sheen. He got it. Now it's time for Meme of the Week, the portion of the show when we get to show off a really great piece of artwork or a meme that one of you guys sent in that pertains to something that happened on one of our shows. This time, a shout out goes over to our Independence Day commentary. During the commentary, we joked about having a pajama party episode, so Roadhog228 on Twitter made this lovely artwork. I don't know why I'm child size in this image, but as you can see, I'm all for it anyway. This is amazing. If you guys want your memes or artwork featured on Best of the Week, you can email some artwork over to mailbag at collider.com or you can tweet at us using the hashtag Collider Best of the Week. Hey guys, I'm Perry Nemroff and welcome to Best of the Week. I bet a bunch of you who just fast forward to the bloopers freaked out right about now. Don't worry, they're here. Let's roll it. Continuing battle for the Iron Throne will be 69 minutes. Yeah. Okay, I'm sure Sasha and Josh are, are giggling right now, so let's not cut to their cameras. Too late. Come on. Look at that face. That's the 69 minutes. <laughs> He's like, it's it's my favorite favorite. Though it's safe to say that Glover won't be stepping into Spider-Man's Andrews at the time. <laughs> Death Note is the live action adaptation of the Magnus. Oh, how do you say? Oh, Magna. Ma manga. Manga. Death Note is a live action adaptation of the manga. Mag. No. <laughs> May. May Whitman. May Whitman. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Well, this is what we call giggle time. I don't know if you had this when you were in high school or junior high, and we'd go through like, the whole like puberty talk and the birds and the bees, and our teacher would be like, okay, now let's have giggle time. And I feel like something, and that's giggle time. Josh has been giggle time right now. Look at him. He's still giggling. Giggle Did you time. Get it? Excellent. I'm just called the orange clown and his hair is always blowing he's like you know like we're building a wall philip like running around like you know and then he explodes and dies for like a full hour he's just tortured to death in a horrible way i'd love to see that I'd all i can this. hear out of that guy's mouth though is kevin yep kevin <laughs> menzel weighed in on her chances of playing the future wicked west witch of the fucking west and dina menzel and Kristen chenoweth originally <laughs> Fucking bitches. Virtual re virtual virtual reality. <laughs> but there's a commercial for a product called Pussy Noodle. And it's Giggle time. <laughs> That's Mae Whitman, right? And Michael uh, Mirabal says, kind of reminds me of the Prestige, which is definitely a good thing. Mog no. It says it says mong manga. manga. Okay, yeah. Manga mong. It's Mae Whitman. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that you brought up Pussy Noodle because it's actually brought to you by the same people who make Houndcock. <laughs> <laughs>
the wickedly talented Adele Kazim. He'll serve as an executive producer in the Vicar series. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I'm yeah. Turn up. Guess what's also in it? Tons of sex, and drugs, and suicide, and drinking and madness. <laughs> manga, manga, manga. At this point, I'm just like, He's like, look at me, look at me. They'll have a Blu-ray. <laughs> yeah. It's called the the May Whitman Cut. Whitman Cut. <laughs> uh, by the by, David will be hosting a new podcast every Monday called, called Giggle, Giggle Time. Giggle Time. <laughs> <laughs> manga, manga. <laughs> and May Whitman's in the movie. <laughs> we weren't prepared for it. My, my mom watches the show. I'm just, I, I can't say. We oh are my so sorry, oh, Mrs. Sorry, Griffin. Mrs. Griffin. <laughs> we apologize from the bottom oh, of my, my heart. Goodness. Hashtag sorry, Mrs. Griffin. <laughs> oh, oh, man. man. That's a wrap on today's episode of Best of the Week. You guys know what to do. Hit the comment section down below and share some of your favorite moments from this week's lineup of shows. I am Perry Nemroff. You can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P Nemroff. Please go on over to Collider.com and bookmark it. Subscribe to the Collider Videos YouTube channel. Watch and read everything, but just in case you don't have enough time, that's what Best of the Week is for. Have a great weekend, everyone. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.